I'm Olga Pirakos, um, and so I'll introduce the team here at Wake Forest University. Um, I think you've met most of us, except Joe. Uh, Joe Winnika Leiden is who, who is the co-presenter with me today, but Michael and Mike will also be contributing to the conversation. Um, we are an interdisciplinary team of engineers and philosophers doing this work and excited to be with you here for a second time. Um, we're gonna start, well, today the topic is faculty development, virtual development, virtual module development, and then alignment with ABET. Um, we, this is a, continue, a continuation to the presentation we gave back in September. So we hope we can fill in some gaps and really share lessons learned that, that we have made over the past uh, two years really doing this work. Uh, Joe has joined us in the last six months and so he's dove in very deeply in understanding kind of what we're doing and contributing to, to this project. Uh, this is the outline for our talk today in this discussion. We're truly aiming for 20, 25 minutes taps of us talking to you and then really allowing conversation to happen. We don't claim to have all the answers. We want this to be a conversation and for us to just simply share what we have learned. Really quickly, I'm gonna stop sharing to, to share a link with you. Um, one second, if I can get all these, all these windows to. For right now, let's see. Work. Okay. So I'm sharing with you right now the link to, to this series of webinars that we've been doing related to character education. You will see a tab there that says January 2021, and that's today's webinar. As we're talking to you, if there's a question that you have, uh, let's use, instead of using the chat feature for questions, it's wonderful to kind of capture the questions using this Google spreadsheet. So if you can add those there, um, that will be great. And then as a way for us to all introduce each other in the quickest way possible, if everyone can use the chat feature to tell us kind of what a little, your name, your affiliation, keep it as formal, as informal as you want and kind of what motivates you to be here and a virtue that you find to be really important for engineers and engineering practice. So that will be the fastest way for us to introduce each other. All right, let's see, good. I'm seeing all this coming, now they're gonna all fly in. All right, I'm just gonna, just, just to pick out some, some of the ones that we're seeing here. Ethical decision-making, absolutely. Catherine Marquette, uh, compassion, yes. Chris at Drexel. Um, Doug, nice to see you, Jai. humility, yes. Um, I, I, I contributed there too. Courage is one that I, I seem to always be advocating for. Uh, ethics, yes. Uh, certainly character education is very much directly linked to, to ethics. Curiosity, yes. I'm just, you can see I'm just kind of picking name and, and then honesty, courage, great.
Kindness, yes, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> All right. Um, can you keep keep those coming? And as those come in, just a, a fast, fast introduction of all of us. I'm going to go back to to the slides. And let me come make my screen a little bit bigger so I can see you all. <clears throat> so we celebrated this week, Martin Luther King. I know Michael Lem and I use the same kind of image or the same quote in our presentations. Uh, in I truly, yeah, we both truly believe, we all truly believe in doing this work that the function of education is truly intelligence, okay, the content we teach, but also character. So that really is at the core of what we're here to do as educators uh, in any profession, in any field, in any discipline that we do our work. So this hopefully motiv motivates you also to be here. This is, we're not gonna go one by one, but this is the team of uh, faculty, staff, uh, and postdocs. We're really grateful to have Kern Family Foundation funding that fully supports to postdocs uh, for us to do this work and then leveraging the, the program for leadership and character here at Wake Forest, uh, also building a larger team um, in that regard. And then wonderful to also, Mike Gross is, is, has taken on a new role as a faculty director for the Center for Entrepreneurship. So we're building bridges in all kinds of ways to do, to do this work. This is also the team, um, the faculty, the engineering faculty at Wake Forest are the true champions of this work. Well, Without it. them, none of this could be done. Um, I, I did a quick count for the presentation for around how many of us have been doing these modules for the past two years. Uh, we have over 12 faculty who are doing this work and are participating. We even have new part-time faculty who are teaching the semester and, and contributing to the effort. So very excited uh, about that. So again, as a reminder, if you can use the link mm -hmm. for questions that you have, I am going to hand it over to Joe to talk about the virtue modules that we have currently in our program. Thank you, Olga, and thank Joe, I think you just muted yourself accidentally. Oh. <laughs> I do that a lot. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Olga. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. I actually come, as Olga was saying, from my background is in uh, religious studies and philosophy. Uh, but I'm someone who really values interdisciplinary work very deeply. So this has been a very exciting um, opportunity for me. And it's uh, exciting to be here with you all. So uh, one of the, our program is to help develop character with uh, engineering students. So of course, it's a very important for all of us to be on board with what actually character is and to kind of have a, a definition we can all use. Uh, our definition that we've been using is character is the set of stable, deep and enduring dispositions that define who we are and shape how we characteristically think, feel and act. I kind of, um, from my uh, earth science days, I like the, the, uh, the metaphor of weather and climate. Weather is variable day to day. You can talk about moods, right? But climate is patterns over time. Uh, climate characterizes certain regions. You know uh, the Southeast where we are by the climate. We know it's gonna be hot and humid, right? So character characterizes someone. It's central to a person, how you see them and also how they see the world, very central to their identity. And when you think about uh, somebody that you know you can depend on, often what we're doing is we're talking, we're thinking about their character, their, their moral identity. So Olga, could you do the next slide? Absolutely. So when somebody says like, if you said this person has good character, um, and then you ask, well, why? What makes a good character? Um, often somebody would respond by enumerating the traits of the person. The person's courageous, they're honest, they're a good teammate, uh, they're creative, they're giving. What these are, are moral traits that we call virtues. And our character is largely formed with these building block of virtues. And virtues, as we define them, are habits that dispose us to think, feel, or act at the right times about the right things toward the right people for the right end and in the right way. 
Um, as Olga said, we wanted to kind of get through a lot of this information and we can go more deeply into this during the question and answer. One thing to point out here is that these are habits. This is something that is durable over time, but that can be educated. I mean, just think about any students you have who you've seen grown, grow over the semester, not just as students or engineers, but as people as well. And you can see how that character can, uh, can change through education. Now, the opposite of a virtue, what we try to avoid is vices. And these are habits that dispose us to think, feel, or act at the wrong times, about the wrong things, toward the wrong people, for the wrong end, or in the wrong way. These two are habits, they are durable. So they do, so it requires intention and intervention to kind of overcome vices and turn them into virtues. So next slide, please. This list here is we have um, at Wake Forest eight courses currently, and we're continuing to develop uh, these courses that focus on have a, a, a character education module or focus on certain virtues. And you can see here in this list, some of the different courses and the virtues that they focus on. Our faculty work to select these virtues as a team to think of what are the virtues that we think of when we think about trying to create responsible engineers with good character that people can depend on um, and that have a good uh, pro-social effect on not just their own lives, but larger society. Um, these are some of the virtues here that our faculty decided we were gonna focus on as a group. Uh, can you go to the next one? Olga, thank you. And there's a lot of way, different ways you can approach this, right? So we have, I'm gonna just show you briefly, two different classes that have um, kind of tackled in different ways, how you take a virtue and try to uh, teach it in a class. Uh, so the first one is one of our introductory engineering classes, um, which is, is very popular. And the instructors here focused on courage. So they focused on one virtue in, uh, specifically. Um, and they had a module that had um, assignments and courses, uh, assignments and classes throughout the semester that focused on this. We we're very lucky that uh, the chair of the history department here um, and also Olga as well came in and gave different classes looking at the history of engineering. So students could do assignments and read about and focus on engineers throughout history that have embodied courage in some way. So they could have these exemplars that they could kind of look at and they'd have models to draw on. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, EGR 312 uh, took a different approach. Instead of focusing on one virtue, it focused on several. And what the instructors wanted to do here was not only um, go through different uh, virtues like wisdom and humility and curiosity, but they wanted to show how these different virtues uh, built on each other and interacted. That when you start talking about something like um, having purpose, you realize that you need to have wisdom as well in order to, to, to know what purpose are worthy of your time and your effort. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a very, very quick overview, I understand. Um, but I'd also, we also wanted to give a shout out to the instructors who helped develop both of these courses because these courses and these modules really are theirs. We were there to support them in this. Um, so back to you, Olga. I wanna make sure that we uh, keep on the time here. <laughs> thank, thank you, Joe. Um, really quickly, we're gonna dive in and talk a little bit about our faculty development process and what we have learned so far. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with self-determination theory, but it's one of uh, it's it's probably one of the most commonly used motivational theories, um, and it's been used in a lot of different contexts, education and professional practice in in, in across so many disciplines. Um, there's three three things that are really important in understanding self-determination theory, which also grind, grounds yeah. our framework around faculty development as well. The three things are competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And so through, through self-determination theory, I'm gonna kind of just describe what, how we support faculty through this process. The first, the first kind of area is competence. And competence has to do with the sense of feeling that one can really succeed and be effective in that activity. Um, you can look at it, it's related to self-efficacy, it's re related to confidence. And so in order for us to build the confidence of our faculty who are beginning to tap into an area that is new, I mean, yes, we can all have conversations around character, but 
to really become proficient and knowledgeable, we truly do need to learn from other from other disciplines. And so um, Michael M from the very first year has been joining us two, three times a semester to have conversations, to build sort of the literacy and speak the same language, begin to understand each other from, from the various lenses and perspectives that we have. Um, Joe has done that more recently and, jo and joins us every within every department meeting. Um, discussions, uh, definitions, we're developing resources uh, that continue to support the competence of faculty. We're developing a virtual handbook that we will that will be used as new faculty join us or our others and we can share with the broader keen community. And certainly coaching. And so where we needed uh, Joe and another two in our two postdocs is just more day-to-day -day, uh, competence and building their confidence and understanding these, these areas. When we think about autonomy, autonomy for someone to be motivated and stay engaged, autonomy becomes very important because it's the feeling of, of having choice. It's, it's, it's a sense of freedom that comes with knowing that faculty get to choose the virtues that they think best fit in their courses. They can leverage their own professional experiences to do that work. Um, and ultimately they own these modules. These are theirs. They get to sort of develop them and it is a process that is iterative. And so we, we allow, we think that autonomy is really important for that, for that purpose. Um, the third area that becomes really important is relatedness. Relatedness has to do with the feeling of, um, of someone having that they belong to something bigger. They're part of a community. They're not alone in this, in this, um, in this effort, in these activities. Um, and so for us in how we support faculty to kind of build the sense of community, we're truly blessed in the fact that Character education is something that is a strategic um, initiative at the university level. So the center that Michael Lem leads at, at the university serves that purpose. Um, when engineering started and we're you know, into our fourth year at Wake Forest, we decided to take this on as a department. So we are one of the few departments at the university who has taken her at that level. And so it's not just at the course level. And so we are doing this work um, and it really helps faculty to know the bigger purpose. Um, we're here to educate the whole engineer. And so it's aligned with both the departmental vision but also the university vision. And, and it's, it, it helps us. So this is an area where um, you're not alone. You belong to something bigger is, is an important piece of motivating faculty and reminding them of this. Joe, back to you as we kind of share some more lessons learned. Joe, you're muted. <laughs> you, you'd think by now I'd stop doing that. Um, you know, especially that's been a very interesting time, and in especially in the middle of a, a COVID pandemic, um, we've 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 learned a lot, especially how to do this under. Um, quite interesting circumstances. Uh, but one of the first things that's been very important has been faculty buy-in uh, that we've really tried to do by um, inviting faculty in. Um, Adetone and I, who's my uh, postdoctoral team member who can't be here today, she's on maternity leave, which is wonderful. We have a new, uh, new smallest member of our department. Um, we just reached out to faculty and started having conversations with them. We tried to have um, in our departmental meetings, just starting to, to um, reach out and show them what the potentials are, how this can really help with what they want to do in their courses. As most of the faculty look at engineering and their work as having a social impact, um, helping those connections has been, has been terrific. Uh, to build on that, establishing a common language, like I was uh, saying at the very beginning, having a definition for character, for the virtues that we can share in common and definitely debate, but that we have this lexicon that we can start building on 
uh, to understand not only what we're doing, but then also as a team, be very intentional about how we then build pedagogy and how we build courses. Um, interdisciplinarity is very valuable, as you can see. Um, I'm, I'm not from engineering. Um, I hope I never have to, uh, for all of your sakes, never actually participate in any engineering project. Um, but you can see this too, even with uh, one of the courses that I mentioned with Courage, one of the history professors came in who's very interested in this and was helping uh, uh, one of the courses bring out really interesting information for the students to help place them um, and the work that they're doing historically. So it's a very interdisciplinary team. Uh, that only not makes it more interesting, but it's we're able to supplement the great knowledge that's already in the department with that from other di disciplines and to then make bridges. So it, it, helps, it helps not just our department, but others as well. Um, as you can imagine, coaching is very important as well because faculty are at all different levels not just in, in their careers, but also all different levels of thinking about um, ethics or character. So some are, at, uh, are very, very comfortable to just jump in. Other faculty need some time during the semester. Some faculty actually in the midst of the semester, something clicks on with them and then asks some of us to, hey, can we, um, can we develop something now? Can we kind of take advantage of something that just happened in the classroom? Uh, so kind of coaching and making sure that faculty know that they're supported throughout has been very, very, uh, very, very important, especially as also faculty, as we saw with those two courses that I, that I showed, um, work in very different ways. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, uh, oh, yeah, of course, small in in incentives. And I don't know, Olga, if you wanted to talk uh, about the in in incentives real quickly. Yeah, I think I'm going to skip this slide and just make it on time. Great, go for it. And um, uh, we can certainly provide slides afterwards, but it, I think I think you get the glimpse of faculty development points. The last the last area that for us has been really helpful um, is alignment um, to Aber. I know this is a question that might be on the minds of many of you as you do your work. Um, one of the first things we did last spring um, and into, into this semester was let's identify the virtues that really map to the ABET student outcomes. And there's truly many, and they cut across the ABET student outcomes that we, we all have as engineering programs. Um, and I'm trying to think how far I should go in terms of giving examples. We, what has helped us, just to kind of move it along, what has helped us is in the framework of thinking about these virtues and ABET student outcomes is inviting faculty to look at their course learning outcomes to identify the deeper, the deeper learning in those and constantly and iteratively kind of go back to the big picture. So we're also helping them see uh, this alignment at at the student work activity level, to the learning of that activity, to the course learning outcomes, to this ABET student outcomes. And so it is something that allows us to go from course level uh, activities to, the, to looking at the entire program. And so this is actually where we're at currently in our mapping of our curriculum and refining this to find even more seamless links where we can have those conversations around character and virtue. So with that, uh, I will say thank you for listening. And we did it, we did it in, in, it's 24 minutes into it. And now let's see, I'm gonna stop. We have extra slides just if, if, if we need to, but uh, I would like to go see if there's any questions. Okay, let me, let me close this. And this is where I'm gonna invite Michael and Mike and Joe. We're all gonna respond and all of you will respond to the conversations. So let's see, the very first one is, says how to move from technocentric to socio-technical teaching. Um, who wants to take that one? Michael or Mike or Joe? I, 
I, I can, I'll take this one, all right? I'll, I'll just go with this one. Let me, let me show you something. I actually, I was, I'm gonna go back to the slides. I was actually, I figured this would come into play. And I kind of want to show you kind of this framework in action. So excuse if this kind of feels rough, but we are in the middle of this. So we're kind of giving you the latest of what we're doing too. So take, take, Take ABEX student outcome number five, which is around teamwork. And this is an area that Mike has also sort of uh, contributed immensely in the curriculum. Um, it has to do, to, to answer that question directly, it has to do with, I think it's important to articulate a learning outcome that truly has those human elements embedded. Uh, it, 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 it starts with taking the things that we all have to do like the ABET student outcomes and beginning to articulate attributes that intentionally integrate those human pieces. Um, talking about the flourishing of others. So when we think about the teamwork that all our students are doing in our classes, how do we talk about the flourishing of every team member? Um, I'm right now teaching Capstone and so is Mike. So we're supporting Capstone teams. And so supporting, having those conversations and thinking about teamwork and the flourishing of each team member, that's one area. Um, another area is thinking about the work that we do in terms of design and engineering design. And how do we bring in our empathy or even talking about empathetic strategies that we can use to go from human needs to deriving system requirements for an engineering system that, that we're developing. And so I think there has to be an intentionality around what we teach in our courses to constantly bring in those human elements. And I, I feel like I can do that in every lecture that I have. I can always bring in those human elements. But well, we also have to sort of support faculty in, in, in doing that. So anyways, I'll stop there and see if anybody else has anything to add to that. That's anyone, anyone, like all of you are experts too, please contribute to that question. This is a discussion for all of us to have. Um, I, I will just add one thing from that, just from my experience. I mean, cause I think these, the, this answer can be, this question can be answered from, you know, the program level, the more uh, court classroom level, just from my experience in the class, um, once you start bringing this language in and have some courses or, or some moments where you introduce this, it can, as uh, one of our faculty members, Kiana Young has said, a lot of it is about reframing. So we had one course where we were looking at, it was robotics um, and one student really likes math and that's really what they're in it for. <laughs> they want, they love the technical problem solving aspects of math. Um, but we were talking about empathy and kindness and love. And so we started talking about like, math is possibly loving. Why couldn't it be, right? What do you do with math if you're in biomedicine? Um, and, you know, I shared my experience of, of being in, in surgery, for example, and saying your love of the technical aspects could actually be a great kindness to somebody who's going into surgery, right? So we kind of, a lot of it is just reframing exactly what um, they were already doing in the class, but with a different language for them to just, just to, instead of looking at it just straight on, just from a slightly different angle to get them to start asking some questions and thinking about it in a different way. I know that's a very, that's a low level kind of easy, low hanging fruit, but I think it's also one of the, the most important aspects of this is that there's already a lot of those potentials in our classes already. Would anyone else like to add to that? What are maybe some strategies that each of you are using to kind of bring the, the socio-technical side of teaching and not just techno-centric? approach. I'll, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's great to see everybody here today. And thank you so much, Joe, for sharing some of the experiences that I might have missed over this past semester when working with new faculty. And I think this might actually get at uh, another question later on. But I ended up developing a module around teamwork. And it kind of just happened organically, but 
the, the way it happened or the reason it happened, I suppose, is that, that I, I met with folks like Joe and, and, and Michael and uh, looking through things that is going to be coming soon in our virtue faculty handbook. And there's, uh, for lack of a better way of saying this, there's lots of options. I mean, there's lots of virtues and there's lots of different ways to think about things and a lot of opportunities. The easiest thing for me in getting started was thinking about the courses that I was going to be doing either at that time or in the next semester and thinking about going, looking through all of those virtues and thinking about what am I doing in my course and, and how could I uh, adopt uh, or change some things that would support uh, growing and developing the uh, particular virtue. I mean, for, for the course I was doing, it was team-based uh, projects. It was a no-brainer. I, I want to do something around teamwork. That did feel like low-hanging fruit, but it went from just something I tried in class to we're in the middle of writing it up right now to publish it pretty quickly. And so I think just kind of allowing yourself to, to just give it a try. Um, don't feel like you have to conquer everything. Don't feel like you have to um, totally transform these students or yourself in, you know, in a matter of a, a short period of time. I, I think I was just looking back on it now in the last you know, year, year and a half, I was surprised at, at how much progress actually was made. Mm. All right, thank you, Mike. Anybody else? Okay, we can always come back to it if you have thoughts. Um, I'm gonna go to, because Mike mentioned the virtue handbook, I'm gonna skip the second question and go to the question that is about the virtue handbook and hand it over to, to Michael. So Michael, the question is, what sort of thing will be in the virtue handbook? Great, thank you, Jeff, for the question. Uh, we're in the process now of refining our, our handbook. Uh, this has actually been a project to think about how we can get students and faculty and staff on the same page, uh, literally, uh, when it comes to the different virtues. And so we have uh, crafted a handbook um, that actually will focus on uh, 12 virtues uh, that we're really defining. And we try to define what the virtue is, drawing on research from psychology and philosophy to kind of get some uh, consensus there. We then describe um, in more detail what that virtue looks like and, and how it's different from different vices or related concepts that might be uh, uh, involved and then what its value would be to engineers in particular. And then we then identify some possible assessments uh, that we can use to help measure that virtue if you're trying to do assessments in your class to analyze it. And then finally, we identify possible ideas for faculty to then uh, apply strategies of character development that research shows to be effective uh, to develop that virtue in their class. And so we have a whole strategy uh, focus around seven methods that we use uh, from habituating virtues through practice and reflecting on your personal experience to engaging exemplars of character to having discussions about what a virtue is or is not to being aware of our biases and also having friendships of accountability to help us be true to who we aspire to be. And so each, each, each kind of handbook page has those kind of categories and we do that for 12 different virtues to help faculty really get a sense of what the literature says about virtue and how they can begin to design modules and assignments that might actually teach that uh, in their class. Hmm. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> can, I, can I share a, a, a very, very recent anecdote like last week in that when I had developed my teamwork module and I had looked at these seven strategies, I I self-identified that I think I had done five or that I intentionally did five. And then in, in reviewing what I had done and, and, and having written it up, Michael pointed out, actually you've done all seven, you may not have realized it. So I do think there is immense value in this uh, faculty handbook. I think it's a great resource. Um, it's, it's very, um, in my opinion, it's very well done. There's, it's, it's, it's very relevant for engineering um, intentionally. But I also do think it points to this, uh, you know, this, uh, the benefit of, of having coaches or mentors or, or just a community, right? Like we're a community engaged in this area and in, the, in this topic. And I, I think that is um, a very powerful mechanism for, for growing not only our, our own knowledge in, 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 in this area, uh, but also helping others. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Joe, would you, uh, you, you're, you're contributing a lot these days to the virtue handbook. Would you like to add anything to it? Uh, no, it's just uh, for me, just on my side, helping faculty, it's just a wonderful resource to have because as faculty will ask for like 
Mike was saying with the paper, I need definitions. <laughs> you know, I need I need citations. I need resources. Do you have actually a discussion about what creativity is as a virtue? It's great. The work is worth it because then we have that resource that that faculty can readily uh, pull from. And um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I know uh, Catherine asked, um, do we have a link to provide the virtue handbook? It's still in draft form. We can certainly, so uh, we were working to make it available, hopefully by, I think by the end of spring. Um, right now it truly is in draft form. And I think we, we actually joined Michael send the schedule out. So we will soon, we can certainly, share and not to share version of what we have so far, maybe uh, I'll check with the others, but um, if you put your email there, we'll, 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 find, we'll find a way, we'll, we'll get it out at some point. We'll add it to engineering and list. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to the second question that was asked and appreciate all the comments you have here for feedback uh, for us, for the presentation and anything else. So really appreciate that. Um, the second question that was asked is, what was the virtue related assignment that was presented in that kind of first course? And, uh, and Joe, so you may or may not know, I, I think I have some version of an answer. I wish that Melissa was here because she's the one that led that class. Um, do, you, do you have a sense of what students were actually assigned as part of that virtue? Yeah, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, what they had was, uh, there are a number of classes throughout the semester where either um, Olga, uh, the uh, uh, our colleague in the history department, um, would come in and have some of these discussions. There were smaller assignments throughout. The main assignment was part of their, it was weaved into their final uh, assignment, where they would actually have to research an engineer from the past and talk about them as an example of courage. That was actually for the final uh, paper that would kind of be, and, it, and a lot of uh, the faculty have done this. They've kind of make it build up throughout the semester to a final project that can match and um, kind of be uh, interconnected with the, the regular assignment they would have, the regular final assignment they would have done. I know, I know for sure because we've been doing that since year one when we kind of I will, uh, were teaching this class. Uh, this kind of thread that Joe is talking about is also directly linked to interviewing a modern day engineer. Mm. And so through kind of the work that we did in kind of sharing kind of not just the historical kind of evolution of engineering as a profession, we also kind of embedded within this module courage and kind of gave those exemplars through from, from a historical lens. And then it culminated with students actually doing an interview of a current day engineer and asking them about, you know, instances of courage during professional practice. And so uh, that's a kind of a way to make it real for students. And it truly is something that they appreciate immensely. It's just that no one has ever asked the question about, hey, where, how does courage or any other virtue fit into the work that we do as engineers? Um, anybody want, uh, look, Michael, you look like you're about to add something. One note on this, I think one thing that's really important about these modules is that um, they go across a, a semester, not just in, in one, one session. Uh, if, if virtue is a habit, we have to actually practice it over and over again. And so having sort of uh, modules that get kind of go across several weeks or even across multiple courses really help to actually um, strengthen that habit. And I think that's what our kind of our, our aspiration for this, this project is really help sort of do this across the entire four year curriculum where these habits are always being reinforced and introduced and mastered in, in different ways. And again, it helps cultivate the habits that we need to actually do this beyond the time they might have uh, in college uh, or, in, or in graduate school. So that's our aspiration. I think those assignments really extend beyond just one session are really helpful for that kind of habituation. I'll, I'll just say kind of because I'm right now teaching the seniors in Capstone. So how we're bringing up courage now is in the context of teamwork. And so as uh, for those of you that are familiar with Capstone, you know, with a year long project on a team, conflict 
kind of hits in, in the middle of it, right? At the end of the first semester, conflict is, is there. And so we talk to them about just courage and being able to have those team conversations that are really honest and real um, as a way to kind of move past and resolve and, and, and reach the point of being a more effective team, a high performing team. So we're doing that assignment right now as the students sort of come back next week. And so they're in the middle of, of that uh, as well. The next question that is here, I'm gonna, Michael, this is your, for you again. How is the strategic aim uh, showing up in other parts of the university? So this speaks more to, to, your, to the center, to the program for leadership and character. Great, thanks, Olga. Um, yeah, our program really tries to transcend different departments. We're offering a variety of programs to help infuse this across the university. So we work very close with engineering on curricular design. Uh, we also do that in other departments like the law school or the entrepreneurship uh, program. Uh, we're giving grants out to faculty in different fields to design new courses on character in history or literature or psychology or divinity or um, computer science. Uh, we have postdocs teaching courses in different fields as well and training them to how to how to sort of design pedagogy that really fosters this work in uh, computer science or, uh, for example, in um, uh, politics as a department. And so for us, it's really a chance for us to really think about ways we can do it across the university. And engineering work has been very useful for us in that process. What we found is that given our real intense partnership with engineering, we're taking lessons that we've learned in this process in engineering out to other faculty now. And last summer in our, in our workshops with faculty, Mike and Olga both shared their own experiences designing courses and modules. And so we think there's a really great sort of mutually reinforcing uh, process here that we hope to really expand across the university and make this kind of a signature part of what Wake Forest offers in our education. Okay, good. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next question actually comes from Joe. Uh, so Joe from Georgia Tech, hey, Joe. He's asking, uh, how do students react to teaching of virtues in technical engineering courses? And how do you build student buy-in? That's a great, great question. Um, I'll, I'll take this one and then invite others to add to it. Um, we, have, we have a student advisory council and I actually ask this question of them as, as we're infusing kind of these modules in the curriculum. Um, so what we're learning is that if, if these modules feel like they're kind of too standalone from the rest of the content of the course, it just feels like an add-on. And so what we're, what we're learning from the students is that they truly innately want to see the connections of all this towards professional practice. So they want to see those links. And so for them, this kind of add-on isn't good enough. And so they're telling us that, that they, I think they appreciate the conversations. Uh, certainly we have, we have a few students who in course evaluations have said, hey, what is this? Does this belong in an engineering class? Uh, it, it's, that's not in any way, that's a very kind of minority perspective, but it is there. Uh, in the same way that we've seen those kind of comments in any type of sort of new innovative pedagog pedagogy that we, we put in our courses, right? Um, and so what we're learning from it is that it truly has to be authentically integrated. It, 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 and, and it takes us time as we develop these modules to not feel standalone. But we also tell our faculty it's it's okay. Like even if at the first run of this, the first iteration, it feels sort of standalone, it's better to start than not to do it at all. And so we find ways through asking also students ways to kind of infuse it and make it seamless and part of the conversation. It it helps immensely when you have a project-based curriculum or a curriculum where engineering practice and not just theory is taught. So I'll just stop there and see what others have to add to this. Anybody else, even beyond the, the Wake Forest team, what are you all learning as you try to have these conversations? I'll just say, 
this is just a general practice that I, I think I think it's a good practice of, of being a, an instructor in the classroom is to have a conversation with your students about your intentions. You know, being a, what what are you being intentional about? Why are you be, why am I being why are we doing this? Why did I design this activity or why did I design this educational experience for you? And what do I hope for you to get out of it? It goes a long way for anything that we do. So just for me, part of the module being um, why are we doing this? Why, why is this, uh, what, what is the value proposition for you? Why, why might this be a good thing to develop? Why might this be a good thing to have knowledge about? Whatever that may be. I, I, I just think in general that that goes, that goes a long way. And I, and I know from, you know, over the years that that's not easy for some folks. Um, I'm guessing it's probably easier for folks in this, this group uh, compared to maybe some others, but I, I understand that, um, that can be, a uh, um, uh, difficult or, or perhaps uncomfortable uh, for some folks, but it really is important to getting that to getting that buy in. I, I think I, I actually want to you're absolutely right, Mike, when I remember when when Joe came to the capstone design class last semester and and talked about creativity and and just ethical decision making in general. He, he asked really open-ended questions to allow them to respond, kind of make it relevant to them right now. And they responded to that. So I think, you know, everything we said about self-determination theory, it also applies to students. They, they, if they feel like there's a right answer you're looking for and they're not getting to it, they're gonna get frustrated. And so we need to build their confidence in having their conversation, these conversations, they also need to have choice. And so we've also seen in some of our courses that when you leave the choice to them to pick maybe a virtue that speaks to them, that also plays well into that autonomy piece. Um, and then feeling that there's a bigger purpose to this, right? The bigger purpose is that we want to make, produce better engineers. And so it, this is a vehicle towards graduating better engineers. And if, if we constantly sort of play into that and help them see those links, um, yeah, I think it, 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 it lays a really solid foundation for that comfort to, to not, to become a habit as my, uh, right, to become a habit. Anybody else would, please let, I wanna, let's see if we can hear from somebody not from the Wake Forest team. I, I know you have ideas and I know you have suggestions because we're all we're all doing this. We may not call it virtues. You're all doing something trying to bring humanness, humanity, uh, this the social aspect of what it means to be a good engineer. So please add to this. I wanna pause and see what we hear. Well, I'm, I'm curious to hear maybe as well, just what do you think, you know, if you're on a fence or you're not sure if uh, this is kind of a, how to get started or if this is even something you really want to pursue or kind of hesitant about how, how am I, can I fit this in my class or whatever it may be, what would help lower that? We're all engineers. Well, most of us are engineers. What would help you lower that activation barrier? How could how could we get you over that? Or what are things that our network or our community could be doing? Uh, or what could we be doing collectively, us, the people in this in this meeting? Uh, that what are like the critical way? What are the critical things that that, that, to, that we need to lower that barrier for? Hi, so this is Katherine Atkinson from Marquette University. And um, as we have talked about adding character to our curriculum, just the term is very loaded for us in terms of what it means and having virtues. And um, so for us, I think we're taking it maybe on a slight tangent and I'd be curious to hear your reaction to it. Um, I don't know if we're necessarily doing character, but we're looking at doing more social emotional learning and emotional intelligence. 
to help uh, engineers understand that empathy and um, point of customer view, you know, point of view from the customer and voice of the customer type experience and just helping them um, interact better in teams. So my role specifically is within our co-op program and running that co-op program and working with industry partners. And so we're really relying on that feedback from our industry partners saying, yeah, they've got the great technical skills, but they need more of that social emotional learning. They need more of that um, soft, so to speak, essential skills of just working in teams. And so that's kind of the direction we're taking. And it doesn't feel quite like character and virtue in the way that we've talked about today, but still along that same line. And so um, for me, just getting over that barrier of the word character and virtues has been um, freeing to just maybe say that I'm going a different direction, but still connected, I guess. So that's what I would share. Thank you for sharing that, Catherine. Uh, your, your comment reminded me that we also see some of that, you know, what we call things, some of the students, you know, it takes time to understand what we mean. You're right. You know, sometimes, you know, you notice that Joe kind of described things as traits or attributes or characteristics. If it helps to kind of start the conversation there and, and talk about, don't even kind of call it virtue, but kind of get there eventually, I think it's it's important. Um, and I, I so, Continue yeah, I, I, Michael, I don't, I feel like Michael, you probably have also seen different examples of this um, you know, from just different professions and disciplines that might call things a little different. What's the, at the, in, the intent, the goal, what would you contribute? Yeah, well, thanks. I mean, it's great, great idea, Catherine. And I know different cultures have different sort of um, sort of preferences for how they think about these concepts. And, and so there's a lot of overlap between social emotional learning and character education. In fact, especially in the sort of primary and secondary school level, uh, those are often sort of tied together very neatly. So you can think about ways you mentioned, uh, you know, empathy being a kind of core uh, virtue that you talk about in different contexts in, in social emotional learning. Um, one question to think about is what are other virtues that are or are not part of that framework? So for example, sometimes courage is not seen as part of that framework. It's a kind of outside that framework. Um, uh, what about humility or justice or other virtues that might be more um, sort of including the character conversation that might not be as central to the social emotional learning framework. So just think about what's actually each framework offers you and how to think about the different concepts and virtues that may or may not be on offer uh, in that framework. And then if you can figure that out, then how might you expand that to, to encompass the, the qualities you really want to promote in your students. Thank you both very much, appreciate that. I also wanna say that I feel the same way, Catherine. Sometimes I'm like, I don't even know if I'm doing this right. I don't know if I'm getting this right. And I ask and um, uh, Joe and Michael, they're just, just Michael's answer, you know? I'm like, yeah, okay. I feel much better about this now. And uh, I think what's, I, one, one thing for me is I wanna, I'm sorry, go ahead. Who was that? Oh, I thought somebody was talking. Um, the fact that you are, are working towards it and that you're doing something and now that you're talking about refining it and now that you're thinking about continuously improving it and learning a little bit more, that, I think those are the, that, that, that's, I think you're doing the right things. Uh, it, continuing to do that is how we get there and having these conversations and learning, learning from um, people like Joe and Michael and hopefully we can get out some of these resources to help with that too. But I think that's part of why we have this community and this network. And I think it's great that, um, that you're thinking about it this way and, and that you're, you're, you're looking to, 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 re to revise and refine and things like that. Cause I'm always doing that. And I, I think I will be for a while, always probably. So Michael, if I could, Maybe ask you, you try to answer your question from St. Thomas' perspective. This is Don Weinkoff, the dean at St. Thomas. You asked what the network could do. I think that there are really several audiences here. You know, we have the faculty, and I think you guys did really well on talking about building their confidence and capability of teaching in this space. That's one part of our work, and I think you guys have really started that well, especially with your partnerships with your philosophy departments. I think there's reluctance from the students, you know? I mean, they come to us because they've been good at science and math and they've been told that's what engineers do. Uh, then they hit these, I would say, innovative courses with 
these topics and they have questions. And Olga said, you know, there's a, there's a minority that don't like it or or questions about it. So we have to we have to show the intentionality of why, why this is important to their professional development. But I think the other piece to this is is industry. Um, and we did a little project where we're reaching out to industry to get to show students what is required in their evaluations once they get into industry, showing those softer elements. Uh, but I will say it, not, not all of those evaluation forms are really clear about how important these areas are. So we also need industry to be able to articulate the importance of it. And maybe that would be the great thing in the network if we could identify some brand name companies with brand name you know, CEOs and brand name things that we could share amongst the network that really just can just really stress the importance of this area. Uh, and you, you introduce that to the freshmen and, and then all of a sudden they're they're sort of, again, those predispositions are erased and they're ready. They're ex expecting this kind of education. So I think those three things, you know, student preparation, faculty, you know, confidence in teaching this area. And then again, I mean, showing that pull from industry and having them be able to articulate what we are doing, what we see as important. Yeah, to, I, I really appreciate that, Dan. And what you're saying actually connects to what Catherine is saying. I do believe those are important. And when we have conversations with industry and professional engineers, they say it's important. Um, we're using different language. They're, we're not, they, the professional engineers are not describing these things as virtues, but indeed when you dig deeper, it's exactly what those are. And so what I've been really impressed with just the past year is we have professional engineers who teach with us in our courses. And so simply introducing them to the framework and saying, do you want to do something? And they said, yes, this is relevant. I see it play out in this way. And so I think that's a great idea to make those links. I just want to link it back to what Catherine said, is that we're simply not using the same language. And so that's the value of some taxonomy that helps connect connect us. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Joe, thank you for sharing resources. I've, I've copied those resources uh, to, to the Google spreadsheet. If others of you have other resources you want to share, let's use this. This is a, a Google spreadsheet we're using in all kinds of ways. Um, I'm trying to see which question to tackle next. Okay, I'll, I'll do it really quick. The one that says about incentives. Um, the thing about incentives that we've learned, it, it doesn't take much. And it's actually the same way that extra credit works for students in our courses. It, it's, a, it's a small stipend and it's a small stipend, even if it's $500 or $1,000 for the year, um, it, it, it gives a recognition that we, we know it takes time. And so for this sort of launch of thinking and the effort and even documenting, um, it's a small thing that I think incentivizes faculty to get started. And once they're there, it's not something that is needed long-term. That's kind of what I am seeing. And uh, it's the same idea of extra credit. I don't know for those of you that have extra credit in classes for like five points, they'll do the equivalent of like two assignments just for five extra points, right? And uh, I think it helps faculty too. It's, it's really, it, it's a small piece. Um, let's see, uh, there's um, Amir, I'm gonna, um, I'll respond. I'll, I'll reply to you in an email about empathetic design. I'll, I'll share a little bit about what we've done in capstone design um, and, and, and assessment. I'm trying, it's, it's we're, we're, at, we're at time. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's time. Ask more questions here. The questions that you ask helped to drive the next discussion topic. So based on what is asked, we kind of determine, and this is, I know what Doug looks at to determine kind of the next discussion. And so thank you for joining us on a Friday. Um, 
We hope you have a great start to spring semester. Uh, for us, it starts next week. I think for many of us, it starts in the coming weeks and uh, wishing you much success and just, just start. Just start somewhere and you'll find hopefully inspiration to keep going. Thank you everyone for joining us.